Adams State College. Great stories begin here. It's my pleasure to introduce my environmental chemistry class. They're, there's just three of them. They're a small but brilliant class. And they're going to tell you about a project that they've been working on in our environmental lab. <clears throat> uh, throughout the semester, we're pretty much done with the project now. And um, they're writing up some results uh, to give to animals and mosquito control. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Scotty Presley here. He is a senior. Uh, double major in chemistry and exercise science. This is Jeremy Schaefer. He is also a senior. He is a double major in chemistry or biochemistry and molecular biology. And then over here we have Samantha Seville, who is a junior in chemistry. Um, and I'll let them tell you about their project. Hi everyone. Um, first time using microphones, so bear with me. Uh, we did a project uh, with Almost Mosquito Control for our biomedical chemistry course. And we tried to find the fluorescence detection limits for them. We'll explain that in a second. Uh, outline. We're going to talk about the purpose of our study, techniques, just kind of how Alamos mosquito control runs, the theory of the machines we used, the instrument components, methods and techniques, and of course our results. So the reason for this study was because the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, is changing their limits on the amount of chemicals that the city can have in their waterways um, because of the Clean Water Act. So they're changing those limits this summer, sometime. They're unknown at this point. But we're trying to help Alamos and Mosquito Control come up with these detection limits so they know exactly how many chemicals they're putting in the water so they can better regulate that for the EPA. Um, some chemicals that they'll be looking at are pesticides, herbicides, and any other farm chemicals, human-made chemicals. We focus on the pesticides that they use. And the pesticide is any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating a pest. The main one we focused on was NBR, because that is their, going to be their main um, pesticide. So Alamos Mosquito Control, this is their district, district of their spraying. This is Alamosa, if you can see it, it's kind of a dark map. It goes almost to Monta Vista and almost to La Jara area. So we have a wide district. And they're switching from Malathion to NBR because it is a better pesticide because it brings down the environment quicker, which is good and it's a better contact pesticide. So they do several different techniques to spray. They dust in the agricultural and very, very rural areas of this Alamosa district. They ground spray. If you've seen in the summer that truck that drives around spraying that mist, that's them. They do this by GPS navigation because some people don't want to be sprayed because they're an organic farm or they just choose not to. So they definitely know where and when they spray. Um, and they also do water spray, and that's where they spray the water aside directly on stagnant water or slow-moving rivers. This is what they call their tree, and this is how they count their mosquitoes to know how many there are, if they need to spray more, if they need to spray less. This CO2 tank is what attracts the female mosquitoes, which are the actual only ones that bite you. And they get collected in this net, and it is run on a six volt battery. It turns on about, a light turns on about seven o'clock at night, off about seven o'clock in the morning. And they catch this for about three days and count them and just check to see if they need to spray more. And they actually had up to 7,000 mosquitoes in this net in a three day collection. So <laughs> we're thankful that they spray. <laughs> um, these are the two main chemicals of Envion that we looked at permethrin and propanium butoxide. They make up about 60% of the chemical, the other 40% being the detergents, which just help it dissolve in water. As you can see, these are what we call in chemistry aromatic rings, right here and here. Um, it's a six carbon ring um, connected by a double bond in the ring structure. And that is what actually fluoresces, so we can detect it in the water, which we will talk about fluorescence right now. Okay. Um, this is just a basic theory on how the absorbance of light works. 
This is the colors that are absorbed, and here's the colors that we observe. So if we go where's the, to our demonstration, where's our light source? On the top. <laughs> Where's that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's covered up. Okay. As we see here, this is a, basically a rainbow. It's white light. I don't know if everybody can see this. It's white light spread into its various wavelengths. And absorption, we can see that, one second, this is red. Can everybody see the red light? That's our red solution. And when we pass it through our absorption, absorption spectra, it cancels out everything but the red, as we see here. And this also works for every other color. I have a blue solution here as well. And as you see, it has various wavelengths, but they're all in the blue-green region. And if we look here, it's 180 degrees from where we're looking. If it's canceling out the, um, all these other colors, then it's going to show blue to green. And if it's canceling out all these, it shows red. So this is the basic theory of absorption, um, utilizing the various wavelengths and how the molecules in the solution bring that completely uh, absorb all of that light. So absorption, as I said, is the excitation of electrons. And that goes from a ground state or their preferred state where they like to rest because they're the most stable into an excited state where they're very unstable. And there's different degrees of energy lost by heat. And that's this energy drop here. And when they get to this state, they make a quick drop, and that's um, falling back to ground state, and it emits a photon or a beam of light. That's the basic um, outline of how emission, which is the emission of light, and absorption of the light waves works. So this is how our instruments work. The wave selector has a light source here which is white light. It enters in through the slit and bounces off of a mirror. That mirror reflects the light onto a grating here. And that grating spreads the light out into a rainbow, essentially like this. And the rainbow has various points of impact for each wavelength. And by moving this grating back and forth, we can select an individual wavelength say blue, green, red, any color that we want. And that is the only color that will come out of this slit. All the other colors are absorbed by the walls of the instrument. This is the basic setup of our instruments uh, for our uh, UV vis spectra or absorbance. We have a source, a wave selector, then the single wave passes through our sample onto a detector, and the detector measures the difference between how much light is going into the sample compared to how much is exiting the sample. So it absorbs X amount of light. And then our fluorometer, it has the source 90 degrees from our detector. And this is because we don't want extra light from our source reaching our detector. And that is because this instrument, the fluorometer, it measures the difference between no light and light. And Scotty will do a demonstration. This is slightly different. This is um, a chemical reaction. But it's essentially the same principle because there will be light produced from these two chemicals. And as you see, there's a nice light. And before, there was no light. That's what this instrument does. That's good. And by measuring the degree of light that's coming out, we can detect exactly how much um, of the species of interest is in our sample. And by doing this, 
we have a photomultiplier tube. If you think of a paper roll basically into a tube, we have one of the photons, the light beams emitted, and it strikes the tube and it excites electron and ejects it from the tube's layering here. And that electron contacts the tube again and it splits and it ejects two electrons. And that continues down for an exponential growth in the number of electrons at the end of the tube. And by having this exponential growth, we can measure the difference of electri uh, um, electric potential and that gives us our detection and tells us exactly how much of the sample is in our unknown. Scotty? So as Sam mentioned, uh, all those in the speedo control have recruited us to find what's called the mental detection uh, for their primary uh, components in their uh, in Vion. Um, for, uh, and in order to do that, we started off by getting dilutions, so, uh, several dilutions of uh, their primary components uh, per methane, 40 parts per billion to 106 parts per trillion, and hypernode toxide, uh, 50 parts per billion to 50 parts per trillion. Um, Again, the dilutions were to generate what, a, a calibration curve uh, in order to find those limits of detection. But just to give you an idea of just how small a part per trillion is, take for instance the piperonyl butoxide, 50 parts per trillion, is like 50 molecules of piperonyl butoxide for every 1 trillion molecules of water. It's really not that big. Um, as uh, Jerry mentioned about absorbance, uh, we use absorbance to find what's called excitation wavelengths for fluorescence. The excitation wavelength is the uh, necessary energy required to allow the electrons of those compounds to uh, become excited. Um, for permethrin, that's at 264 nanometers and hypernodium toxide at 288 nanometers. We did start with the standards of these compounds first uh, in order to get, in order to generate um, um, emissions and absorbance spectra within the eye. Um, these uh, wavelengths are not visible in uh, the uh, in the visible spectra. These are actually in the ultraviolet region, so we can't actually see those with the naked eye. And here are the absorbance uh, spectrum that we use. Um, as you can see here with permethrin, uh, it absorbs here, again around 264. Cooper and we could actually has absorbs in more than one place. It absorbs uh, around, around 240 or so. We, we chose not to use this one because of interference with the absorption here from the solvent that was used. So we wanted a more distinguished curve, uh, a more distinguished peak uh, that could easily identify that compound. Um, the, fl the fluorescence of what we used to uh, determine the emission wavelength uh, using the standard and beyond for obtaining these limits of detection. Now, what are limits of detection? Well, limits of detection is uh, the smallest amount of component necessary um, smallest amount of component necessary to distinguish between the background and the species or chemical of interest. For permethrin, that was around 528 nanometers, and for piperonium toxide, we used 575 nanometers. And here are the fluorescent spectra of the permethrin over on your left. Actually, you can see how both of these uh, emitted in several regions, but we were more concerned about where the strongest emission was, which was for um, permethrin around 528, and for piperonyl butoxide around 575 nanometers. And so we use this information to find what's called LOD, or limits of detection, which is determined by taking three times the standard deviation of the sample emissions uh, divided by the slope of the calibration curve, 
the slope. You probably remember from algebra that y equals mx plus b. We take the m. And here is a, a sample calibration curve of the Pippernil epoxide we used in pond water. This is at the Cattails Golf Course, that pond there. Um, you see here the, uh, the uh, straight line here. For this one, it's 14.065. Um, you notice here that with this calibration curve, that uh, intensity is a function of concentration. That is, um, at higher concentrations, the intensity at which the emission occurs gets stronger and stronger. And this is the basis of what we call um, uh, st uh, standard emissions, in which uh, Jeremy will explain more about. Okay, a standard addition. We started out with an uh, unknown sample, our pond water, and we added um, a known concentration of our standard. And by adding that in increments, we generate a straight line. And by generating the straight line, we can extrapolate the exact concentration of our contaminants in our unknown or our pond water. <laughs> so that's essentially how we know what the concentration of our pond water is and how we generate this curve. And so we were able to determine the limits of detection. Uh, there we go, right here. Uh, okay. All in parts per trillion for the Rio Grande flowing water and for that pond water. These are theoretical uh, limits of detection but due to residual contamination. So to conclude our presentation, we, as Scotty mentioned, discussed that theoretically we can detect down to less than one part per trillion of our pesticides in water, but experimentally, due to residual contamination, we estimated that we can actually test down to five to ten parts per trillion. Uh, this is still an awfully low number, so it's still very good. Um, but we also, this was a very good technique because it is an easy, fast method to detect the chemicals because all animals in the speed of control has to do is put their sample in the fluorometer, press one button, within two seconds, their reading will be there. So we are very happy with our results. Um, we'd like to thank Elmos and Mosquito Control for giving us this project, Dr. Renee Eaton, our advisor, who accepted the project in Adams State College for letting us use their facilities. Any questions? Adams State College. Great stories begin here.